Hello, beautiful and awesome friends. You are tuned in to the Beyond Freedom Church with Teresa Lusk Ministries. I'm Teresa Lusk. I am so thankful for this day. I am going to just go ahead and be real honest with you. Uh, from the very beginning, I have had just a uh, just a kind of a heaviness for the church today, for the church of, of the Lord, um, just for the bride of Christ. And so I think it's a perfect time actually to uh, get to minister on the bride of Christ. And uh, I'm so excited. Happy, happy day to you. May the Lord richly bless you. I pray that as you watch this, that your heart would be stirred for so much more of him. You know, I, I have learned to have to be found faithful Sunday after Sunday uh, to come and bring this word to you. And, you know, some days it gets a little hard uh, just because you want to kind of lay around a little bit. I'm sharing the social media page. You know, you want to be laying around a little bit. and uh, But then I just I'm thankful that the Lord has found me faithful enough to do this. And I pray that as you continue to do life in the Lord, that you would set your heart to be found faithful with what the Lord has given you. Um, you know, we are truly blessed. And I know that every single one of us, because we're made in the image of Christ, that there's something that every one of us can bring to the table. We can bring corporately to the body of Christ, which that's really a, a, the, the bride of Christ's job is to corporately together bring in some mixture of things. Um, so I'll give you an example. When you go uh, minister somewhere or, or you go to a ministry event, I should say, and let's say they have several ministers lined up. They all bring the word. They all minister a little differently, but every one of them brings something to the table. Well, that's the body of Christ, the bride of Christ really working and operating in such a way that his gifts, his identity are all being brought in and manifested in such a powerful way. And so I just encourage you to remember that there is something that is in you that will be used for great things. But I want to be really real today and I want you to set your heart to receive from me because I can say things to you. I can preach the word all day, but unless you've given me permission to, 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 uh, unless you receive from me and say, okay, you know what? I respect her enough. I, 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 I will receive from her. Then a lot of what I say may just fall by the wayside, or it may offend you and frustrate you instead of encouraging and empower and exhorting you, which is what my heart is. So today I'm going to minister with such a truth and I'm going to have to kind of get in your sweet, beautiful faces a little bit and call people out leaders and, and sheep. Okay. We're all sheep at the end of the day. We're all the sheep of the Lord, but there are some things that I want to bring to the light and be honest with you about it and, and, and call it out because right now the church needs to the church, the bride of Christ really needs to take her position. And unless we do it corporately, we can't do that. So let's see what the word of God says. Let's look at Revelation 19, seven through nine. It says, let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. So what's going to happen? You're the bride, I'm part of the bride, and you're going to make yourself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure for the fine linen. Watch this is the righteous deeds of the saints. Did you know you're also a saint? Your priest, king, bride, son of God, child of God, saint. I mean, we've got all these names that the Lord has assigned to you and I and saints is one of them. But it says it was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. So what did we just learn? That the bride will be ready. Okay, so we will be ready. We will be ready. We would have made ourselves ready. You know, it says that we will, the bride has made herself ready. 
us individually, which then ends up being corporately and you will be ready. It says her fine linen is righteous deeds uh, uh, of the saints, which is you. Okay, I got to go there for a moment. You see, it says righteous deeds, not deeds of wickedness, not deeds of darkness. It's righteous deeds. So that's part of your call as a bride of Christ is to prepare yourself, be ready with righteous deeds, because that is what your clothing will be. I think that's really awesome. And then blessed are you if you get invited, right? He said, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. I know that it seems like who knows when Jesus will come. Some people will say, oh, I think Jesus is coming back real soon. The Bible doesn't say that. So we do have to be careful with how we assign timelines and whatever. It actually tells you not that you don't know that Jesus doesn't know. So we need, we do need to kind of back down from that. Um, but it says, blessed are you if you get invited. So that has a lot to do with what happens here on earth. Don't get it wrong, my friends. It happens like that. So I want it. I know that this may seem like a far away concept that we can't get, but the whole purpose of how we do a thing today is because it's, it's an, it's got to have eternal value. So my heart was early on to fall in love with the Lord. I used to say, God, let me hate what you hate. Love what you love. I want to fall in love with you, Lord. I want to be all in with you. I want to give you everything that I am. I want my eyes to be yours, my heart, my mouth, my body, my money, my children. Okay. So those are some things that are really hard for some of us to give up our money, our children, etc. But from the very beginning, I began to call out to the Lord that those things which he already had planned for me, my spirit was already beginning to desire. Now think about that, my friends, because I want you to understand that if you belong to the Lord, to the Lord Jesus Christ, to the family of God, your heart will begin to desire the things that God desires for you. He desires righteous acts. He desires holiness. He desires a loving person. He desires for you to rise up and bring hope to the darkness. He desires to use you and your family to be an example for other people. He desires you to rise up and be equipped and prepared to be, uh, to lead something to, uh, whatever. So those things are already in you. Now watch second Corinthians, uh, 11, one through four. It says, I wish you would bear with me in a little foolish foolishness. Do bear with me for I feel divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband, meaning Jesus to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from the sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus, than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. So here, here's what I've got to say. Bride of Christ, I'm talking to you. Is your faith still sincere and pure? The reason why I say this is because in this time, in the time of, at the time of this recording, COVID is all out. And it has really saturated the minds of the believers in many ways. Some of us have been able to be um, above it and say, I recognize what's going on. I feel in the atmosphere and I'm going to talk about intercessors in a little bit. I'm just going to give you so much stuff. So hang in there and watch me go point by point. But, um, you know, with this COVID, so many people are finding themselves disappointed. Uh, they lack passion, fire, uh, even their churches have opened and they haven't made their way there. And, and I know that people are you know, going to say, well, what about this? I'll talk about that in a moment. But he's saying, is your faith still sincere and pure? You know, obviously these people were giving their hearts over to something else, but guess what? Whenever we stop pursuing passionately and giving our hearts over to what we know to be true and right, for the lover of our soul, when we start going a different direction, it is possible that you change one spirit 
for another or that you're giving yourself over to another spirit to come and speak to you and to come and take place and to come and and give you theological training and what i mean by that is it, you can come and, and receive um a spirit of depression oppression torment fear things of that nature so are is your faith still sincere and pure meaning it really is you believe god because you believe god and it's pure there's nothing else taking the place of that or have you received a different spirit from the original one you you uh you know received which you know hard times depression not having a strong foundation of christ it will do that and then what you receive as truth has a spirit it doesn't mean it is good this is such a powerful deliverance concept uh, and i'm i know this is not a deliverance training but i want you to kind of get that because he said um, he said, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, meaning anytime you receive a truth or something that, that, that lies in your heart as truth, it carries a spirit. So during this season where, where things just seem to be kind of um, getting shaken up and things are getting weak, churches are closing, falling apart, the economy is going through its own moment, um, you know, is it that we've exchanged the spirit of truth with the spirit of oppression, depression, torment, lies, worry, etc. You know, or maybe even a spirit of hate and anger because because you're watching so much stuff and and they're teaching you how to think and they're training you how to think. You know, those are things that are happening right now. And you know what it's doing? It's slowly breaking the 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 strength of the bride of Christ because we are a church because we gather together because we're, we're, we're a whole. It's a bunch of us making one whole. And so we, we I want you to remember that um, there is a true separation of sheep and goats. I'm going to read you a scripture on that in just a second. But before I do, here's what you need to know. Um, the sheep are constantly dependent on their shepherd. The goats are very independent. Now watch what the word of God says about it. When the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Amen. I could stop right there and you could be like, whoo, before him will be gathered all the nations. Hear this, hear this people. This is so good. And he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So apparently I read just to kind of prepare myself for this. Uh, I read that it's hard to tell the difference between the sheep and the goats, except if um, the shepherd is the one who's separating them because the shepherd knows his sheep, right? I mean, that's even a biblical concept. So the shepherd knows how to tell the difference between the sheep and the goats. He says, and he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, excuse me, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So we need to understand right now there is a separation between sheep and goat. So in the body of Christ, we're starting to see a little bit of a filtering. Even now, even though this will be something that will be done uh, at the end of time or at the end of our time here on earth, um, we will begin to see this separation. And so while something looks like, you know, something can look like it's genuinely falling apart because of a sickness, a pandemic, because of a whatever you call it, my friends, don't be misled. The bride of Christ is being clearly separated and shown who really is because you've got to be able to separate yourself. And so that's not a bad thing, but the bride fulfills a collective whole, the responsibilities of the kingdom of God. So let me hear you. I want to, I want you to hear this. There's a call for change from the throne of God. Second Corinthians six, 14 through 18 says, and then I'm just going to start uh, just speaking some things to you. Do not be bound together with unbelievers for what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness 
or what fellowship has light with darkness, or what harmony has Christ with Belial or worthlessness, or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever, or what agreement has the temple of God with idols, for we are all the for we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from the midst and separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean. And I will welcome you and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Why am I sharing this? Because the bride of Christ must separate herself. I did not say that you could not minister to the world. That's what we're supposed to do. But some people have become one with the world. So the bride of Christ is ineffective because we're so divided. Oh, this is okay with the with God's word. This is okay. This is okay. We're 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 just you can't tell the difference. But the word of God says, what partnership has righteousness and lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness? He's asking. He's he's testing them saying, "What are you doing?" Do you not understand that you're the bride of Christ and you're separate, you're different. So for your function to be fully effective, you must separate yourself. Stop thinking like they think. Stop approving what they approve. Stop believing what they believe. Stop, um, you know, being greedy like they're greedy. Stop, you know, whatever. He, that he's just saying there is nothing. There's no partnership with righteousness and lawlessness. There's no fellowship and um he says, what do you have with, in common with an unbeliever? We blend so much with the unbelievers. That's not the call of the bride of Christ. So you need to see that. So here's, you know, now that you understand that the, that the foundation is that the bride of Christ will be, she will be a pure bride. The Bible says it. She will be bright and pure. Can I just tell you that bright and pure doesn't just happen? Yes, we're cleansed by the blood of Christ. Yes, we're redeemed by him. Yes, we're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. But if we continue to make sure that lawlessness and, and righteousness try to mix, that's not pure and bright. That's not. We get to make that choice. So make sure you pay attention to that bride of Christ because you are called to not allow that to be enmeshed one with the other. I know it's not a popular message and that's okay. I'm willing to do the hard things because in the end, I will be held responsible for what I preached. You know, the Bible says that the leaders will be held to a, the teachers of the Bible will be held to a higher um, degree of responsibility. And so for me, I, I can I can tell you some fun things and I, I will challenge you in just a little bit, but I got to keep it real biblical. And in the real biblical is separate yourself from that which you partner with and fellowship with because your job is to be separate. Why? Who can tell the difference? Who can tell who you belong to when you're so enmeshed? When Christ comes, as the word said, he will to separate the sheep from the goats. Will you look like a goat? How will he be able to separate you into the right hand, to his right hand side, like the Bible says, when you look just like a goat? See, that decision is up to us. We decide if we are going to look like sheep or we are going to look like goats. If you missed that scripture, go back and read it. Matthew 25, 31 through 34. It says he will um, come and separate. That's so important, my friends. Okay, so now that I set the foundation that the bride of Christ is supposed to in the end look bright and pure and that her clothing will be righteous deeds. Okay, her clothing. Think about that righteous deeds. So if I asked you right now, bride of Christ, do will you look like you're clothed with righteous deeds? What will you say? Think about your life right this minute. All of it. Do you 
think you will be clothed with righteous deeds. I, you know, if, if this, if this kind of is a little hard to listen to, I get it, but I've got to challenge you because, um, you can't, you can't say you want to be part of, you can't say you want to be part of a football team and play like, and, and play like a soccer player that doesn't work. God has his guidebook rule book so that you know how to be different. Okay. So, so there we go. So righteous deeds, holiness, God is looking for sheep, not goats at the end of the day. So what does that mean for the bride of Christ? That means that as the bride, we're allowing a lot of what's going on in our world to weaken the church and thank God that the, that the gates of hell will never prevail against his church. Jesus, um, you know, his word makes it clear, but here's what we need to be reminded of. Here's some things that I want to challenge you in and guard your heart as you hear me, because I don't want the spirit of offense to rise up and receive this. I want the spirit of the living God to rise up in you, receive it and turn it into truth. There are some things that I'm going to say that you're not going to be able to agree with. That's okay. But I want you to hear this. Number one, bride of Christ, it's time to gather again. I know that this is going to flip some people's lid because they're going to be like, are you kidding me in the middle of COVID, blah, 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 whatever. Yes, it is still time to gather again. It's not time to allow your church to fall apart. Some of your churches are open. If your churches are open if you have the faith to walk out of your house, hear what I said. If you have the faith to walk out of your house and you know how to take proper precautions and you know how to respect other people's space, go back and gather, gather because the body of Christ, the bride of Christ needs to be gathering together, empowering each other. And I'll share, I'll show you that in the word here in just a little bit, but it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing to just watch from home. And I'm going to deal with that in just a second. But if you're able to bride of Christ, continue to gather, maybe you're not able to gather for very specific reasons, health issues, etc. but you're able to gather in your living room and have ministry time there. That's great. Do it. It's time to worship together again. It's time to live holy lives again. Okay. It's time to move the demonic agendas out of the way. And I'm going to talk to you about that in just a second. And the church as a whole will either thrive or survive generationally. If we don't pursue the holiness generationally and power filled church, then we're going to have the problem that the children of Israel had. If you look at the problem in the Old Testament with the children of Israel, constantly from one generation to the next, you would see the breakdown in their families. You would see that all of a sudden they're having this, this great idol worship party, you know, and they're all living sexually impure and they're having this, they're, they're making, um, gods with, they're, they're, you know, making their own gods and they're just living so unholy. But here's the thing. It went on from generation to generation. We are not to give the devil a foothold so that our generations today can be broken down. Circumstances can sure put a halt on your life. We know that you know that because you've had your own difficulties in life where you're rolling, you know, you're doing your thing and you're just getting ahead. And all of a sudden, bam, the day of evil came. Why? Because there was a fiery arrow sent to you by the enemy himself. And some of those fiery arrows, they carry a month's worth of, of nonsense. They carry thousands worth of nonsense. Some of them carry years worth of stuff of nonsense. But at the end of the day, you are to rise back up. And here's what, what's going to happen. If we stop gathering with our church body, then, uh, lives will be, people will be living and suffering in secret. Okay. Think about how many people we're still getting along with and talking to and praying with. Some people have made a great effort to stay in touch with other people, et cetera. But at the end of the day, the, the, the family will begin to kind of get weak and we have to be careful with that. We have to be careful with that. So I want to talk to the leaders real quick. Now, leaders, I'm going to tell you the same thing that I just said to everybody. When I first started this video, I said, I'm going to do some hard, I'm going to say some hard things. 
I'm going to say some hard things. And if you don't have a heart to receive, they're going to feel like I'm picking on you. But no, today is the day to uh, call the, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ to take her place once again. And to do that, we have to be honest and say some things that some people aren't willing to say. And so I'm going to say some of those things this morning. So the first thing I want to say is this portion right here, this little portion is for the leaders first, but it will apply to you. Just like when I talk to the, the congregants, it'll be for them, but it'll still apply to the leaders. So the first thing I want to say is leaders, pastors, apostles, teachers, prophets, evangelists, um, uh, you know, listen here. It's time to submit ourselves to more and more humility and correction. The bride of Christ has to submit themselves to humility and direction, but it starts with the leadership first because leaders have to go to the front of the line and they have to be the examples for people. So if we're willing to be humble and to subject ourselves to the correction of the Lord in this season where everything is unknown, where the result of things is unknown, where we don't know, um, you know, where people are, you know, depending on hopefully a vaccine or that the economy will get better. I don't know, but here's what I'm saying. Leaders, while we are in this difficult season, submit yourselves to humility and correction. Before COVID, there was so much lack of humility going on in so much of the leadership. And I know that, again, this is a hard thing to hear. It doesn't mean every single person was, doesn't mean every single leader, but sometimes even this statement that I'm making, when I'm saying not every single leader was, so many people will say, okay, that wasn't me. Yep, I know I'm good. Well, when was the last time you were bold enough to ask the Lord and say, God, if I lack humility and correction in my own life, show me. When was the last time? Was it uh, recent? Are you willing to? Because leaders have to submit themselves to humility. Why? Because we as leaders expect other people to submit themselves to our leadership and correction and we like the word submission a whole lot. And so if we're going to be if we're going to be expecting the church body to submit themselves to us, we need to make it easy for them to submit to. Now, don't start getting frustrated and saying, oh, but don't you know, but my congregants and my members. And no, no, let me just bring out the truth for now. Let me bring out the truth for leaders for right now. And I'll deal with the congregants in just a moment. But the bride of Christ, if she doesn't rise up, starting with leaders, some will suffer. So, okay, there, so, so where is your genuine request to the Lord? Where are you, I should say, in your genuine request to the Lord to hold you accountable, correct you, and to, to deal with any lack of humility? I pray, my friend, my leader friend, that that is you today that you don't just run around expecting people to submit to you and to be correctable and teachable. I've met so many leaders like that. It's so abusive. And I'm not surprised that things aren't getting back on board real quickly right now. I'm not because there are some serious things that need to be corrected. When uh, this first started with the COVID, one of the things I said to the Lord is, Lord, knock off the leaders off their chariots, including me knock us off our chariots. And you know, I'm telling you that it's so important to make sure that as we try to pursue the, 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 the new going back to our church gatherings, as we're trying to pursue, um, you know, just fulfilling the call of the bride and the church of Christ, as we're trying to pursue that, these are things to start seeking after. Because if we don't, we're going to go back to the same thing. I'm not picking on people, but I can tell you, even watching certain services online, you can feel there's a lack of grace there. And can I tell you, just knowing the Lord for myself and knowing how he works in many instances, a lot of that is because people have not stopped. Leaders have not stopped to deal with themselves. 
they have not stopped to deal with what's been hidden, what's been trying to, to be uh, swept under the rug or, you know, whatever, because we, we're just be, we're above correction. Not it. The next thing I want to ask you leaders is your secret place, a lifestyle. How can we go back and invite people to come back to our services, back to our church, back to our ministry events. If the secret place is not a lifestyle. Now, if you're asking what's that secret place, then, then leadership is not for you. The, the, every leader should understand the lifestyle of the secret place. That's a place where, where people became very familiar with before before they even became leaders, because you can't get to a true leadership position until you've gone through the refining of the secret place, through the intimacy of the secret place, where you separate constantly, consistently time with the Lord, where you talk to him, he talks to you, he deals with you and you correct. See, and then where he empowers you, he teaches you, he downloads from heaven. You can always tell when somebody has a lifestyle of the secret place because number one, they're humble. Number two, they're teachable. Number three, they go deep in the word. You can't deny that, my friends. They go deep in the word and they have many experiences to share with you. They're not, a, they're not afraid to be vulnerable. They're not afraid to be teachable. They're not afraid to tell you their mistakes. That is a sign of the secret place. So leaders, as we prepare to go back and bring in our church members and, and, and to get back to life, there has to be something different or else there's no grace over going back. There's a reason why I believe that people are not feeling it even. The next one I want to share with you is um, how can we expect fire from the sheep and depth from them? If our flame is low, it's the same thing. You turn up the fire in the secret place. So I've heard many pastors, they put this on the sheep. Oh, well, you know, you just, you can't do enough to get them lit up. I understand. Is that true? Yeah. It's also true. Sometimes it's true. And it's also sometimes true that the leader themselves don't have the fire. That the leader themselves try to walk up to the pulpit or to the uh, social media camera or whatever have you, you know, over and over again, week after week with nothing that's changed within them, but they expect different results. It doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. So for us as leaders to go back and expect the sheep to take in what we say and what we, what we, you know, what we've got to bring to the table, there better be some fire at the table. There better be some depth at the table. It's time to teach them that they can actually take in deeper things and that you're not going to lose them because of it. You know, eventually, if you keep putting uh, pieces of meat in somebody's mouth and, and they didn't know how to chew at first, eventually they will learn how to chew. So I've, I've heard that a lot of leaders, they keep back the deep from people because, uh, oh, because they're not mature. Well, you can't feed the milk forever. If you're constantly just feeding the sheep milk, that's about the leader. That's not about the sheep. Eventually you have to teach them to take in the meat. And, and just like any class, you know, some teachers will keep on going until they catch up until the students catch up. And there's just some people who aren't interested in catching up and that's okay. We'll deal with that in just a little bit. So then, uh, they have their responsibility, but we deal with the leaders first. My friends who are leaders, is there a relational aspect to your leadership? Uh, for so long, I've watched people that they, they love what you can bring to the table. They love that the people will attend church. Their numbers are big. They feel comfortable. They feel confident because they have a lot of people come in. But when those numbers start going low, they start worrying about it. So my question is you individually, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to you individually as a leader, apostle, prophet, evangelist, teacher, pastor, etc., whatever, even Bible teacher, whatever, uh, ministry leader, whatever you feel that leads people to growth in Christ. Is there a relational aspect to your leadership? Because if not all your concerned about is how many people you can get into your building, how many people you can get into your event. So before this pandemic, what was your life like with the congregants? What was your life like with the sheep? 
Now, I know that some people may say, well, this is not about the bride of Christ. She's cracking the whip on the leadership. No, this is because the bride of Christ will continue to grow and to expand and to really fit into her identity as leaders take their part as congregants take their part. Now, those of you who aren't a leader, don't get too comfy because I'm gonna talk to you in just a moment. I gotta talk to you, I gotta keep it real. And so is there a relational part? What's relational? You would be amazed at how many people do not understand the, ra- the, the relational aspect of being a pastor, of being a teacher, of being whatever, they don't get it. They think relational means you saw them at church on Sunday, which made the leader happy because I've got the numbers, Uh, But the relational part is calling, texting, setting appointments with your people. How do you feel? How are you doing? Or maybe assigning other leaders to reach out to your people and say, how are you doing? How's life? How can we pray for you? Etc. That's the relational part. Matter of fact, I wrote a book and it's probably backwards here, but it says winning favor with people God's way. 10 principles that will change your life and those around you. This is a leadership book. I teach you 10 principles that a lot of leaders have not even gotten a hold of. I'm not picking on you and saying, oh, look how, how, you know, uneducated. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that relational leadership, you actually have to train yourself in it. The Lord will train you. Other leaders will train you. But before we want to get back to things as usual, where are we leaders in the relational aspect? And then was there a controlling spirit that led your, your, uh, sp- your uh, leadership lifestyle? There are many who expect to be submitted to, but are not willing to submit and they're not loving. Nobody's going to submit to you if you're not loving, except if they're under a spirit of control. And if somebody's submitting to a controlling leader, that's a problem. You're gonna have to deal with that yourself. You're gonna have to be real with yourself about that. So that's very, very important. And then are we bound by the seeker friendly spirit or freely moving in the Acts 2 uh, church model? The chapter of the book of Acts chapter 2, it begins to teach you how the church was originally meant to go. We're so taken over by this practical seeker friendly method. I despise the seeker friendly method because we actually lower the church of the living God to just practical things. We put God in a box. It's probably the most unhealthy thing that's ever happened to the church, to the body of Christ, to the bride of Christ is probably the most unhealthy thing I've ever seen. And I know that not everybody's going to agree. That's okay. We don't have to agree. We can agree to disagree, but I'm telling you, are we, where are we with that? Are we just looking for, um, uh, just, you know, to have happy congregants or transformed congregants? I'm not saying practical doesn't work. We all have to learn how to do life, but, the, but, but we, it's how you prioritize it and how we bring it in. So, so that's something that I encourage you as a leader to take to the Lord and ask him to show you, um, what, what needs to be done. And then the last one for the leaders Uh, Before I go to the church, I have many more, but I need to deal with the the congregants as well before I run out of time is it's our it's not our service. My friends, I'm going to say this. It's not our service. My leader friends, it's not your service. It's the service of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit service. So we are to submit were to submit and say, Holy Spirit, what do you want to do today? Not what does Teresa want to do? Not what pastor so-and-so wants to do, evangelist so-and-so. No. What does the Lord want to do today? I understand that you prepared and you spent a week on your message, maybe two months, some of you, you know, I get that. But at the end of the day, it's not our service. It's the Lord's. So I just want to encourage you. Now, let me talk to the church body, to the congregants, the members, those of you who are not in leadership. And just like I just spoke to the leadership, I want to speak to you and I'm asking you to receive, receive what I have to say to you, because this will actually, if those, if many will listen, if many will take this to heart. And when you go back to your churches, you're going to begin to see some amazing things happen if you submit yourself to. But let me just make this plain and clear. COVID has revealed the hearts of many in the comforts we seek 
and for some, the fear that has overtaken them. COVID has revealed the hearts of many. Some people have used it to say, well, I can't go to church. I don't want to go to church. I've just gotten so comfortable. See, I've gotten so comfortable being able to watch my minister online, but blah, 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 whatever. And while I am appreciative that people will watch this online, um, this is not the best. This is not God's best. This can't replace human contact. It can't replace gathering. It can't replace worshiping together. It won't. It won't. And, 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 and the thing is that um, stagnation and complacency happens step by step. Nobody became stagnant just like that. Nobody became complacent in life just like that. Nobody. The bride of Christ has given up so much of her um, position and who she is and what she's supposed to be doing and accomplishing right now because something hit the globe. Now, I realize that we all have to learn to, to work through this, myself included, my family, my children. I've had to pray for my children more than ever through this season because they're little social bugs and it's like all the kids just suddenly disappeared, you know, and so and there's other things that, that, you know, that people go through in isolation. But the truth is that the body um, has just become so comfortable and they and it shows that they were already comfortable. There were some things in the flesh that um, they were comfortable in. And this made it so easy for them to say, oh, I'm just going to watch at home today. I'm just going to, you know, well, you know, I can still catch it online. That's not it, my friend. Step by step by step, you'll begin to see your faith and your fellowship diminish. Now, I'm not the kind of person that thinks you can't take some time and be at home. Uh, I don't believe that at all. I don't believe in that you need to be controlling people and telling them that they need to be showing up every single Sunday. And I know that some people really do, and that's on you. I do think it says, do not forsake. The Bible is very clear. Don't forsake the gathering. So to, to not go once or twice versus forsaking, two different things. So the body of Christ, bride of Christ, you're supposed to be rising up. If your church was open today, why not go? Why not bring in what's in the, what's inside of you, the spirit of the living God and sing your little heart out. Forget who's telling you, you can't sing, sing your little heart out to the Lord. What if you just went in there and prayed that this spirit of oppression, depression, stagnation, that it would break and open up the heavens. What if that was what your role was today? Or, or, or maybe it was last Sunday or, or, or maybe, you know, you'll watch the, some, some will watch this later. I'm not picking on obviously on all of you who are watching, but I'm saying that there are people who are going to watch, um, but they went to do other things um, and they just skipped church. And sometimes we have certain justifications that satisfy the flesh. So what are the justifications that are going on in life right now, bride of Christ, that are satisfying your flesh? The commitment to the church body can no longer be dependent on how we feel. All hell has broken loose on earth. As, you know, we see it here in the U.S. because we're not just dealing with, uh, with the pandemic. We're dealing with, with all kinds of political craziness. And so why? Because of how we feel. We've got to stop with how we feel. And it's time to rise back up and say, God, reposition me. Father, reposition me to rise up, to be a part of the movement that moves things forward, that moves people forward, that moves the church forward, that causes the bride to rise up and move forward. You can either be a spectator or you can be part of the movement. Which one will we be? Which one will we be, my friends? And so... Um, let me just say this. Some people say, well, I can't do that right now. I, I can't, I can't, you know, do this. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to go visit and, you know, my, but we still visit broken family members, right? We're still visiting with people who, who, um, in our families are broken. The church family is also your family. And so I just encourage you to see that. All right. So then your leaders are not perfect and neither are you. So if you have hurts because your leaders have hurt you, I'm sorry, my friends, and I pray genuinely right now in the name of Jesus that if anybody who's watching, 
if you're watching and you say, Teresa, uh, I was injured, hurt, offended, etc. I pray that the Lord would lift that off of you right now in the name of Jesus. I pray that the healing oil would just saturate your soul saturate the place where you've been broken where you've been devastated where you've been def where you feel defeated where you feel wounded I pray that that be bound up right now and allow you to be strengthened once again and keep moving but guess what my friends that prayer also belongs to the leaders because they too endure hurts so I pray the same for you leaders. If you're just devastated, disappointed, if you feel like the people are not receiving from you and you're doing all the things that I recommended and some, and, and you're just not seeing it, I pray that you move your sights from what you see and that you move your sights to the fact that you're, raise, you're rising up uh, when you do to be faithful to the Lord because we do all things as unto the Lord. So when we bring our service, when we bring our spiritual teachings and wisdom, revelation, uh, the, the, the fruit of the secret place, the fruit of going deep in the word, the fruit of being teachable, and you're not seeing somebody receive it, remember that that is still going to be rewarded. So don't let that get you down. So I pray that even your hearts as leaders will be mended and, and, and just bound up and let the sweet spirit of the Lord minister to that area. Um, and so let's be graceful to one another, sheep to the leaders, leaders to the sheep. Let's remember that um, this isn't a how, how can I control you and how can I uh, uh, resist your control? This is let's be the body, let's get empowered spiritually, and let's walk out the call of the Lord. And then um, um, I understand that sickness will keep many behind, the fear of sickness. Um, this is why I said if you have faith to attend church. So I understand that some people aren't going to be able to, and that's okay. If you have faith for it, get back on it. The glory of God is revealed when we gather in a group. So watch Hebrews 10, 25, and I'm, um, I'm going to get close to the end here. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Worship is a force, my friends. Can I just speak to the worship people real quick, uh, to the worship leaders? And I want to say this, worship leaders and worshipers, those who stand at the very front, the first ones who open up the service, who lead the congregants into an experience of worship. Can I just challenge you? Can I challenge you individually and corporately because the bride of Christ is a corporate thing. Can I encourage you and challenge you to begin to go to the secret place? It's not okay to only worship and prepare for worship when you're going to perform. We have to understand that worship is, is an act of service to the Lord, that alone. So get to the place where you too are in the secret place, where you and the Lord are there and he's healing you, he's preparing you, he's bringing forth um, uh, just a preparation and revelation so that when you get back, when we all start to get back in the mindset of we're the bride of Christ, we're the church of God, we need to gather and push back the forces that are trying to keep us from expressing our best to the Lord when you get back out there, let that worship be so heavily anointed because you've spent your time in the back uh, uh, behind closed doors, worshiping and surrendering the Lord, allowing him to teach you and, and, and um, heal you and even prepare you to promote you uh, to keep on spreading this beautiful worship that we all need as a church body. Nobody, my friends, I'm done with telling everybody everything. Nobody, none of us, none of us can move forward and bring back the gatherings of the church, of the bride of Christ, without checking ourselves first. It's time to deal with uh, the lack of humility, the, the, the carnality that keeps us lazy, that keeps us stagnant, that keeps us good enough, and that's all across the board not just congregants, not just leaders, 
all of us. So will you, my friend, make the choice? Will you make the choice to make a difference? If your church is open, will you make a commitment to bring back the fire to the congregation? What would happen if you showed yourself faithful? What if you went deeper and showed yourself faithful in character first? right? In godly character first and in your lifestyle, in your mouth, with your money, with the way you treat people, with the secrets you try to hide. What if you just exposed that to someone you trust and got set free? What if you came back to your church body and caused a fire revival to break out? See, we can't just uh, go back just to go back. There needs to be a reason for it. And so some people don't even miss what they had before. Some people don't. And can I say, I get it. I get it because so many ministers and people that I talk to the in ministry, outside of ministry have both said leaders and, sh and congregants alike have said, I was tired of the same routine of, of, uh, not seeing the, the movement of the living God, the power of the Holy Spirit being released. I was tired of the feel good uh, messages that were aimed at your carnality instead of at your spirit. And the, the way you know the difference between the two is if it's always telling you um, how to react and how to respond and how to, th those are carnal. Th that's great. We all have to learn. But at some point we need to have already managed to, de to deal with our carnality so we can move into the spiritual to the deeper spiritual realm of things and so that's part of the frustration with spiritual leaders that they want to move from teaching you how to deal with your flesh so that they can deal with how do you move in the spirit how do you cast out demons how do you lay hands how do you prophesy how do you give a word of knowledge how do you allow signs miracles wonders to follow and so i get that my friends but what if you took responsibility and ownership and, and, and began to say, Lord, make me a part of the revival. Make me a part of the movement. Prepare me in every aspect of my life. I ask you, I just plead with you, do not ask the Lord to do this for you without also asking him to deal with your character and with any sin that you have hidden in your life. Holiness, love, freedom, and power are all still in style. So ask the Lord to deal with you. Be willing to surrender because the Lord, the Lord can deal with you, but you can be saying, nah, I'm just going to keep on playing with this. I'm going to keep on playing with this darkness. But if you want to be part of the revival that could break out, be part of that solution. So Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that my friends who are watching, that today in this moment, they would catch a fire for those things that you've called them to do, that they'd catch a fire to bring forth a, a, a just a passion once again to worship, to gather, to overcome fear, to be prayer warriors and intercessors. God, that they would stand mightily, Father God, for the church first and then for, for our nation and then the nations and the government and their city and their family. Father, light a fire in them that they will begin to be used for the change that can happen. I break the hold of resistance over you. I break the hold of fear over you, the fear of sickness, the fear of what could happen, the fear of death even. I break depression over you in the name of Jesus. Oppression, that stagnation that comes over you. It makes you lazy. It makes you okay with what is. I break that loose from you now in the name of Jesus, that you'll seek him greater. Father, I'm asking that those who are watching would call out right now as, as they're watching me in this moment, that they would call out and say, God, give me a hunger that will not stop for your word. Give me discipline that will lead me to your word. Give me obedience that will carry out your word. Give me a revelation of your Holy Spirit fire and power that I may walk in the supernatural and be a great representative of Christ cause me that when you're ready to come back and separate sheep and goats, you find me with linen of righteousness and purity in the name of Jesus. My friends, if you don't know the Lord, 
I'm asking you to surrender your heart. There's so much godlessness. There's anti-God movements. There's anti-God. There's an anti-Christ spirit over the United States of America for sure uh, in a way that we've not felt, I believe, at least in my lifetime or since even I became a believer. Maybe some people can say, oh, it's been around. Either way, I know that it's, it's heavy over our nation. And maybe you're looking for answers and you're looking for answers in a place and in a way that's not God's will for you. I can tell you that God can turn your life around. I can tell you that while it will never be perfect, there's no such thing as perfection. You will receive the ability to have comfort if you hang on. And if you learn that what you believe about God, if it's not healthy, that it's probably not based on truth. Jesus loves you. He gave his life for you. He died, but yes, he rose again. He sits at the right hand of the Father because he rose again. And in the rising again is power. Power for you to live a free life filled with the love of God and that you can be turned into a completely different person. If you would have known me years ago, my friends, you would have said there's no way the Lord can change her life, but he did. My friends, may God richly bless you. Please go to Teresa Lusk Ministries, uh, excuse me, TeresaLusk.com. Donate, uh, support our ministry. Uh, go to our website as well and subscribe for our newsletters. And uh, I, had, I had said that we were going to do an event, but unfortunately, because of some of this, some hotels aren't even uh, allowing a rental for space. And so I thought, okay, uh, maybe I need to just give it a, a few more weeks. So we're still searching, still looking. So just uh, be patient with us and we will gather again. But those of you who have a church, go back, support, encourage, and light the fires. May God richly bless you. And I love you, my friends. Take care.